Well, can everybody hear me? Good. Yes. Well, I, uh, first of all, uh, Jacob, thanks for putting this together. And, you know, this stem, stemmed from uh, a meeting that we had in, in uh, south of Athens there uh, a couple of years ago, or last year, I guess. And uh, how could we work better together between Kansas State and University of Georgia and Kansas, we feed a few cattle and y'all raise a few cattle. How could we get together and, and have a discussion about um, cattle that are coming our way and, and how can we work better together? And, and uh, I appreciate it very much. A little bit of back, my background, uh, third generation veterinarian. Uh, my granddad started our vet clinic in 1938 in a town of 250 people in Southwest Iowa. I was raised in a cow-calf operation and veterinary services um, and then got tired if you remember in the 70s and 80s the key angus cross and Semitol cows we pulled a lot of calves um, and i did not want to do that for a living anymore after doing that with my dad and grandpa for years so i decided to go into feedlot practice and uh got into feedlot practice and started having feeder heifers trying to have calves and i wish i'd have been back pulling calves with some of those big old cows because uh, we have some issues. But what I want to talk about or share and have a discussion this evening is, you know, we, we as a beef industry have to continue to work together. And we are offering more now for cattle that I, I, I want to say preconditioned, but we just want cattle that are managed properly before they come to, to us. And, and, us being the cattle feeders and I, I see more uh, dollars. The big thing is, is people think that, well, it's just, I, I precondition, my neighbor doesn't, I take my cattle to the sale barn. They both brought the same amount. And so I'm not gonna do that anymore. And I can understand that if you are a producer and you have, you know, a hundred head of calves and you wanna take those to the sale barn and deliver them today and you know they're all alive and you know you're gonna get paid for them. I'm not naive enough to think that that taking those calves in, preconditioning them in a dry lot, feeding them is is something that's easy to do. Um, but I do understand that from my standpoint, I'm gonna go through some slides on on the difference that we see when those calves have been preconditioned, or even some of the components of preconditioning have been taken care of. Um, can add value to, to what we do. I'm proud to be a part of the beef industry. Um, I tell our students here that being a part of the beef industry is biblical and uh, that, uh, you know, it's been since the, the dawn of man that we bring the fatted calf in and kill it and have a feast and celebrate. Um, when someone gets a raise, they don't say, hey, let's run out and get us a sprig of broccoli. We, uh, we talk about uh, eating a steak and celebrating the good times. Um, but we also use the trim for a lot of retailers. Y'all represent um, cow-calf, stalker, probably cattle feeding um, operations. I'm very fortunate I've worked in cow-calf and feedlots my entire life. I now supply a lot of uh, support for uh, Tyson, Cargill, National, and also work with McDonald's and Yum Brand Foods on the finished product. But the thing we have to start thinking about is this one beef concept and doing things right in one segment is good for, for all segments. And, and when we think about the issues that we have, whether it's antibiotic usage, animal welfare, uh, sustainability, and, and, and that, we have to start thinking about preconditioning as being one of the major components to decrease in antibiotic usage to improving animal welfare by decreasing morbidity and, and mortality of feeder cattle, um, and, and, and moving the, the puck forward. I hear a lot of people talk about sustainability and sustainable beef, and I can tell you this, that the number one thing that McDonald's is worried about sustaining is themselves, okay? And I think that most people, when you sit down and you talk about sustainability, we get caught up in this, this uh, save the world, save the globe type mentality. And at the end of the day, if we don't have profitability, we don't have sustainability. And, and we can worry about animal welfare. We can worry about environmental stewardship. We can talk about food safety and security. 
but if our income doesn't equal or exceed the exp external inputs, the increase in cost, we can't stay sustainable. So when, when we think about sustainability, I don't want people to think about sustainability in the nutshell of, of well, McDonald's wants somebody that has cows that, that don't contribute to global warming. That's not what sustainability is. What McDonald's and other companies are trying to do is they're trying to predict which cow herds are going to be in business in 40 or 50 years, which ones are sustainable, which ones are profitable, which ones are, are having management practices that are going to lend them to get bigger and, and stay throughout the, the next 30, 40, 50 years, because they're trying to predict where their uh, beef supply is going to come from. They're trying to figure out, I want to keep selling hamburgers and French fries, where's my hamburger going to come from? So they're trying to predict in the future who's going to, to be sustainable. So they aren't doing it because they're trying to force us to do something. They're doing it because they're trying to predict for their own business. The one thing I don't think we have understood is the true value of a properly managed calf. And we want to look at the sale barn price, you know, per pound, but the biggest advantage of preconditioning comes from the added pounds that someone puts on those calves. And, and if you can get the same price and your calves weigh 100 pounds more than, than your neighbors, you have to remember that you just beat the, the slide of, of those calves being bigger and you're getting a price for, a, for the lighter weight calf. So I think that we have to put it on apples to apples. The way we buy cattle in this country is the opposite of the way we buy cars. We buy a car, we buy the base, we have the base model price, and then as you add bells and whistles, you increase electric windows, uh, AM, FM radio, I guess that's kind of standard, but uh, we add, as we add these things, you increase the price. When we price cattle, we put cattle at the Cadillac version with all the bells and whistles, and then we start to deduct because we in the beef industry respond better to deductions than we do premiums. And, and so what happens is we have the, the price for the calves and the calves come in the sale ring and they got ta testicles attached, deduct. They got horns, deduct. They haven't been vaccinated, deduct. They duck, they're balling, deduct. Um, all of these things roll into the stress that these calves are going to have when they get to us. And so, there that we're going to see the deductions. I think preconditioning is is probably our um, or at least helping those cattle understand uh, where water tanks are and having them vaccinated is important. I use this example all the time. I was on the school board up to Riley County here, and if you all have that on your bucket list to do in your life, um, scratched it off. That was the worst experience I've ever had. In my, in my entire life. I, it, I was so glad when it was over, but I went into our principal and I said, hey, um, I, I want to help you uh, day one. And the two things that kid, kindergartners need to come to Riley County Schools is they need uh, vaccinations and they need a social security card. And, and this record of immunization, I think it's costing us too much. We don't need to vaccinate them you know, beforehand. We'll vaccinate them on arrival like we do in the beef industry. Um, on the first day of class. Now, kindergarten roundup, we're going to do away with that. There's no need for those kids to, to know who their caregiver is going to be. They don't need to know where the lunchroom is or the bathroom or the water fountain, uh, what their day is going to entail. Uh, we'll just have those kids learn about that on the way into school. We'll call it blacktop kindergarten roundup. Now, when those kids get into there the first day of school, you know, what we're going to do is have a group of us by the front door. And when the flatbed pickups and the minivans and the, the suburban start pulling in with those kindergartners, what we're going to do is we're going to run out there, grab that kindergartner, run back in and shut the door. Okay. That's, that's called abrupt weaning. Okay. Now there's going to be some balling and bellering outside and there's going to be some balling and bellering inside, but don't worry about it. It's going to subside in two to three days. Okay. Now, what, 
we haven't vaccinated them yet. We'll push these kindergartners up to the end of the hallway. We got 51 kindergartners. We got three classrooms at 17 head on three-way split. We're going to bring them back one by one. We're going to vaccinate them there. We're going to kick them into their classroom. And the good news is you can only expect about a six to 10% death loss. Okay. And, and it seems so intuitive for us but it is something we're doing every day in this industry. If calves aren't prepared, if they don't know how to eat out of a feed trough, if they don't know how to drink out of a water tank, if they haven't been vaccinated prior to getting there, I can tell you that anybody that started any calves, and when I was the veterinarian for cactus feeders, one fall we started 250,000 head of four weight cutter bowls, and I was their only veterinarian, and we scattered those across our 10 feed yards. And I can tell you that I learned what morbidity and mortality really is. And so, so some of those things that we need to, to do. I'm gonna go through some things that, that include some data from feedlot consultants. Uh, and and uh, I'm also gonna go through some things that we've learned along the way. But the first thing is that the things that, that dictate morbidity in, in our systems here in the feedlots is the cattle flow. Okay, that's one of them. And if we overwhelm the system, and this year we brought cattle, we bought, we bought a lot of cattle out of Georgia, North Carolina, into our yards, and we brought them in in October. And this isn't your fault, this is, this is, this is a two-way street, okay? Two things, the, the three biggest things that I think that, that for starting calves here in our part of the world, is we got to have a calf that's managed properly before it gets to us. We have to be able to, to look at the weather forecast and, and, and work with, with the weather forecast. But the other thing is, is we have to have enough people here on our end to make sure that we can take care of those cattle when they come because cattle flow is dictated by the market. And once somebody starts to pull calves off grass, everybody starts to pull calves off grass. And the next thing you know, the cattle are, are brought into the sale barns in bunches and we overwhelm our system out here. And, and that can be, um, be an issue. In weight, the lighter the calf, the higher the death loss. We, if when we go from three weights to four weights to five weights, you can see here that we go from 5% death loss to 3% death loss to 2% death loss. And then once we get to six weight cattle, we will have about a 1% death loss, regardless then of, of what those cattle. Now that's different geography, different, you know, a five weight coming out of Nebraska is gonna be different than a five weight coming out of South Texas. And, and, and likewise, Montana versus, versus Georgia. Y'all have some of the best cattle we have ever fed coming out of Georgia um, when they're managed properly. And, and, you know, I used to lease a grow yard there in uh, West Point, Mississippi. Um, and I would buy cattle and the guy said, oh, you're gonna buy some opportunity cattle. And uh, he said, uh, y'all gonna buy them and put them in there and knock the mud off your own potatoes. And uh, I learned pretty quick that I wasn't very good at cleaning those uh, potatoes and it was almost a financial catastrophe. But, Co-mingling, I hear people say, well, we don't need to be co-mingling cattle. Like our average, um, if there's anything that I could probably say to y'all to increase the value of your cattle coming to us, on feed, on water, the ball is out of them, castrated, dehorned, uh, vaccinated is fine too, but we also like to have one load lots, right? A hundred head is generally speaking for cattle coming out of y'all's part of the world. I hear people all the time saying we shouldn't commingle cattle, but I can tell you that our average cow herd size is 40. Half the calves born are boys, half the calves born are girls. And our average feeder pen size out here in feedlots is 150 head. So if the average cow herd produces 15 to 20 head of steers and 15 to 20 head of, of heifers, we're going to have to comb. If they never went through a sale barn, we would have to co-mingle seven to 10 cow herds for every feeder pen we have. And I think that, that when, when we can put them all on one truck 
send them out. We don't have to commingle, and we can put them straight into a hundred head pin, one load pin. That increases the price of your calves uh, tremendously, in my in my opinion. Um, that doesn't mean you're going to get it, but for me as a veterinarian, um, these are things that that we look at. When we when I was at Cactus, we started swiping the the sale barn tags. And cattle that were going to sale barns to order buyers out to us in the cattle feeder, we had cattle on average from 32 different sale barns in five states per load. And, and they're balling. And so when we start to think about that and everybody wants to talk about, well, I'm an animal welfare specialist because I didn't use a, I mean, I used a, I didn't use a hot shot on these cattle when they go through my processing barn. You know, when we start to plug in 10, 15, 20% death loss, as expected, I think our industry can can do better as we move forward. Now, I will say this, before we go any further, I'm not a rookie, and whenever I've done a preconditioning talk or talked about the value of feeder calves, the only people that show up or log on are the people that are already doing it. So if you're preaching to the choir, um, you know, I get it. Transportation, the length of the haul, I think we're gonna learn a lot more about this. Um, we have terrible air circulation in trailers. I just had a grad student do some, some work on air circulation. Uh, metal tops in the summer, the cattle on the top deck, they get extremely hot from, from that. Smokestacks and diesel smoke, all these things can be an issue. But um, heat stress is a problem more for our fat cattle cold stress is a problem for our lighter weight calves. And if we have calves without a hair coat or thin hided calves, um, we need to start boarding these trucks up. We even now, when we're bringing cattle from 15 to 20 hours away, we'll deep bed those calves on the truck so they can lay down. And, and so these are some things that I think that, that is marketing. And as you think about picking the person that's it's going to transport your cattle if you're going to retain ownership putting some deep bedding on there after 15 hours is when cattle start to lay down and and so cattle that are coming from y'all are going to be a 20 hour 15 to 20 hour haul um, and we will start to see those calves starting to lay down but boarding them up can be um, something that can help and in the summertime with heat stress obviously if the truck stops they can't stop at a truck stop where the, the trailer is blocked from wind. We got to have a crosswind to help those cattle uh, stay cool in those, those trailers. One of our problems here, and it might be a problem for y'all, depending on how you're, if you're a stalker operator or something like that, but if you are, if it takes you longer than five days or seven days to build a pen, a wreck is coming. And I have this more of an issue with some of our smaller producers that they're sale barn habits are to go in and buy a trailer load this week, the next week, and, and maybe it's going to take them a month to build a pen. And we have cattle of all different stages of, of from post vaccination and weaning and, and different uh, time periods of disease, that this is something that, again, if I can buy one load lot and I can fill a pen, when that truck pulls in, it makes the cattle worth a lot more to me. We have to worry a lot about our receiving pens. Uh, we always think about in the fall we, when we have terrible rain and making sure that, that our receiving pens, you know, when those calves come in, they're exhausted. They don't want to go for the water tank. They don't go for the hay and the feed bunk. They go for a place to lay down and rest when they come to us. That's the first thing these cattle do. They'll almost peat rose slide into the dirt to just lay down in those receiving pens, kind of like we are after a 20 hour drive. Um, they just want to kick their shoes off and, and relax. And if we have mud, you know, we think if we don't clean the whole pen, we're going to have, we can't make a difference. But if we just hook onto the box blade and we just make one lap around that pen and give those calves a dry place to lay down or mounds. But uh, we have found bedding not only in times of, of mud and cold, but bedding when, when we have high temperatures. When it's 97 degrees outside, a bare dirt floor is 137 degrees. And cattle will be exhausted and they'll go to lay down and they can't because the ground's too hot. We've actually been putting bedding out for calves at this time of the year 
and six inches of straw will decrease where the cattle are, decrease the heat of where the cattle are laying by 25 degrees. And and in the dairy industry, they say a cow that's laying down is a cow that's making milk. And for us, it's it's a calf that's that's having immunity, or it's calf that's that's starting to put down muscle. Cattle handling, um, processing. You know, for what we do is for every hour a calf's on the truck, we give them an hour to rest. So if we have a, a cattle that have been hauled out for a day, we'll give those cattle an hour to, to rest. And, and when we work them, it's not a timed event, okay? We are gonna try to do a quality job. Sometimes we will run those cattle through our processing barn with the chute wide open so that they will walk through the processing barn and learn, especially if they're, if they're retained ownership cattle. We recommend that, that people do that when they do it at branding um, so that calves get used to this is not a bad experience. Um, you know, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna show you how to go through the chute and then the next time they come through, we'll actually work them. I, I hate to put this up because it's so busy, but I'll just tell you how we vaccinate calves and what we're using when these cattle come in. Um, the difference between a high-risk calf and a low-risk calf, obviously a, a, a high-risk calf is one that hasn't been weaned, hasn't been vaccinated, um, lightweight, um, you know, th th those kind of calves are stalker, backgrounder operators get a lot of those in. Low-risk calves are calves that are preconditioned, um, they know where the feed bunk is, castrated, dehorned, and, and so everything's gonna get a five-way modified live viral on arrival, okay? That's, that's generally speaking, that's what's gonna happen. And the biggest difference between high-risk calves and low-risk calves is we don't give the low-risk calves the manheimia vaccine. When it comes to black leg or clostridials, we will give the, I give those to everything. And, I, and it used to be we didn't because we used to have five cc uh, clostridial vaccines and they all went in the muscle and they created uh, issues as far as the soreness of calves. Now they're all 2cc black leg vaccines and they're sub Q and we don't have the issue with with soreness and and problems with with that. Um, I, I for the 30, 40 cents, 60 cents, whatever a black leg vaccine costs, I, I give that. The other thing is if you ban calves, we need to give them, make sure that we have tetanus toxoid in that vaccine at the time of banding um, so that we can prevent a tetanus infection. But using the Manheimia vaccine, 75% of the consultants use it on high risk calves when they come in. I think the best time to give a Manheimia vaccine is, is pre weaning and weaning uh, so that it has an opportunity. Vaccines aren't they don't just take effect at the moment we give them. They're not like an antibiotic. A vaccine takes five to seven days for that calf's immune system, if that immune system is functioning, for that calf to, to stimulate or take that vaccine and turn that into something that will protect that animal from the disease we're vaccinating it for, okay? Any questions on vaccines? Nobody's throwing anything or, all right, we'll keep moving. If you have- well, What was the vaccine for, if, you, if you're banning cattle? The, we would give a tetanus toxoid. Thank you. You bet. And, and what it is, is basically that's an eight-way clostridial. You can buy the seven-way black leg with tetanus. And, and that'll, that'll cover you. Oh, I'll, I'll just go back here. So the ones we don't use, I don't use histophilus vaccines. I don't use uh, pink eye vaccines. I don't use mycoplasma vaccines. I don't use lepto vaccines. And I don't use pastorel. The only thing I really use on these calves is a manheimia. And I know that y'all are gonna to run to your veterinarian or if you're a veterinarian on here, I apologize. Uh, um, this is not, you know, always work with your local veterinarian and uh, cause they'll know better about what's working in your area. But uh, I'm just telling you what, what, we, what I do 
in the feed yards I consult. Once the calves get to us, if they're high risk, we're going to use metaphylaxis. So this is another reason, you know, I tell producers here, you know, it's a $20 bill when you use metaphylaxis. And metaphylaxis means mass treatment with an antibiotic on arrival, okay? Whether it's Draxin or Zuprevo or Zactran or uh, Exceed or you name the drug, it's a $20 bill when those calves come in per head. And I said, you know, we can either choose to pay someone sitting in the corner office of a pharmaceutical company as cattle feeders for the antibiotics we're gonna to have to use, or we can pay it to someone in our industry that's raising cattle right, that we don't have to use the antibiotics. And the scrutiny of our industry in antibiotics is going to get worse, not better. But I can tell you this, metaphylaxis or mass treatment on arrival works. We will decrease morbidity 50% every time when we use this on calves that are balling or high risk when they come in. So we'll decrease our treatments by 50%. So what that means is if I was expecting to pull 30% of the calves for respiratory disease and I use metaphylaxis, I will wind up pulling 15%. 50%, I'll pull 25%. Now, we're going to get into some of the fun stuff. Okay, castration. We need calves castrated as early as possible in life. And, and I don't know how many of y'all go out and tag your calves when they're born, but here's kind of what we're recommending. When the calves are born, leave them alone the first day, okay? The mom doesn't need them tagged to know which calf is hers. And, and let them get colostrum. Let them, let them get and make sure they're up and they're nursing and getting colostrum. And then after they've gotten colostrum, then you can go catch that calf and we can, we can uh, put the tag in its ear. While we're putting the tag in its ear, there's two things we could be doing that would increase the value of your calves. One, we could reach down, if it's a bull calf, we can band it and use a little Cheerio Elastrator bander. You just slip that over. And now I tell my students, I said, it's pretty technical. You gotta be able to count to two to be able to do this because you need both testicles below that rubber band, okay? So we do that, we band them. We can go up, we can feel their head, just like they do in the dairy industry. And if you feel little bumps, those are horns. And if you have a butane bit, disc butter with you, you can burn those horns off and you won't have horns and you won't have testicles, okay? Now, the reason why people say they leave the testicles on those bull calves until weaning is because they say they want added pounds, that those bulls grow better than the steers. I can show you studies from K-State University of Florida, University of Arkansas, that will show you that if you castrate a calf in the first week of birth versus uh, leaving them intact until weaning, they will not have any difference in weight. For the testicles to produce a calf to grow faster, those testicles have to produce testosterone. Testicles on a bull calf do not produce testosterone until the bull is eight to 10 months of age, and we wean at six to seven months of age. And, and somebody get to arguing with me and I'd say, hey, how many of y'all throw a five month old calf out to cover your cows to, to breed your cows? You don't, you don't do that because they hadn't hit puberty, okay? They haven't started growing yet from, from, from their testicles. So I tell the students, I said, the earlier you castrate, the better because the, the more attached the cat, the longer the testicles are attached to the calf, the more attached the calf is to the testicles. When we have bull calves come into our feedlots, bulls versus steers, we will have 150% the pull rate and we'll have 1.5 times the death loss if they're intact when they get to the feedlot and we cut them on the day of arrival. Horns is, I mean, if we think that soft tissue surgery of cutting their, their huevos rancheros off of them is painful, cut and skull and horn off of them on arrival is even double that. So, so decrease in intake and, and decreasing performance and decrease in health and increase in death loss is attributed to, to those two things. The third picture I have on here are bred heifers. 20% of the heifers that come to our feed yards are bred. And the higher risk the cattle are, the higher the pregnancy rates will be. And of those 
10% of them are long bred or more than five months gestation. And, and if, if we don't preg check and abort, if you sell heifers and they're guaranteed open heifers, they're gonna bring more. Because now, right now, we're preg checking and aborting all the heifers that come into the feedlots. And, and uh, we're using ultrasounds and, and it costs us three to four bucks a head to, to do that. So these are some things that I think, as we move forward as an industry, will add value, okay? Um, Jeff Foxworthy has his deal, might be, you might be a redneck if, you know, we do ours, it's gonna be a wreck when, and our number one was it's gonna be a wreck when more than 1% of their body weight is testicles, okay? When they come into to our feedlots. And so if we can just get that taken care of, it will be a huge, huge deal in this, in this country. I already talked about that. When do we castrate them? We castrate them right at arrival. Um, we don't, we don't delay because if we do, there's some of them that are sick. If we wait till first reimplant or 85 days, they get too staggy. Um, the best way for us to gauge whether calves are going to get sick or not is intakes. And if cattle aren't eating one and a half percent of their body weight by a week and a half on feed, uh, a wreck is coming. This is something, whether it's stalker, backgrounder, whatever, cattle are so sensitive. Sick cattle don't eat and cattle that don't eat get sick. Only got a couple more slides here and then we'll, we'll open her up for, for questions. Um, when we ask people, again, this goes back to the size of the loads. If you guys can put them together, but our optimum pin is 100 head. And the reason is, is that for high risk calves is that when, when the truck comes in, if there's a 100 head pin, we're gonna have 100 head on the truck we don't have to add from other other trucks or other loads to, to fill a pin. For bunk space, everybody wants to talk inches. And I said, you know, I've yet to walk out there with a ruler and say, oh, hey, yeah, I got plenty of bunk space. My, but the way I gauge it is if I feed them and they can all come to the bunk, I've got enough bunk space. If I feed them and they can't all come to the bunk, I don't have enough bunk space. And, and so that's something that, that we do. Um, another thing that I think will add value to your, your cattle today, at least around here in our sale barns, our cattle are getting wilder and wilder. And I talked to one, one old boy the other day and he just said, well, you know, we're kind of doing it to him. And I said, how's that? And he says, well, he says, I get out of the truck just long enough to cut the bale wrap off. And then I unroll a bale for him. I get back to my truck and drive off. He says, uh, I, uh, you know, everybody's got fence line feeders now for their cows. So they pull up with a mixer wagon to their fence line feeder. They don't get out of the tractor and they, they uh, run the, that, that feeder through the, the and, and they just drive off. And he says, and now when we doctor them, he says, we don't get out and shoe one up to shoot. He says, we pull in the pasture with our dart gun, roll down the window like we're road hunting and shoot one up. And he says, hell, he goes, why wouldn't they be scared of us? And, and here's the deal. When cattle are scared of us, they think we're predator and they're the prey. And the one thing about predator prey relationship is that cattle that feel like they're the prey and they don't trust us, they won't show their weakness because the coyote or the fox or the, the wolf or the bear or whatever attacks the animal that's weak, the one that's sick. And so when they're sick, they hide their clinical signs because they don't trust us. As we acclimate these cattle, just like we do a, a wild horse and we tame these animals down, we start to gain their trust. We start to know their daily routine. We start to see that. And, and then once they trust us, they'll say, okay, I'm sick, help me. So, so something that we're really focused on is spending more time on the ground with your cattle so when they go in the sale barn that they aren't ricocheting off the the sale ring fence and and those calves walk in there and there's no ball in them i just think that from what i'm seeing those are the people that are topping the 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 market obviously genetics and how those cattle look are, is extremely important too but all things considered those are are 
things. When we ask feedlot veterinarians, what are the biggest factors for predicting feedlot pull rates and death loss? We do this survey every five years. The number one thing every year is how those cattle are managed before we get them. In, you know, you can't make chicken salad out of chicken poop. And, and if we get high risk, long hauled, lightweight, co-mingled, non-acclimated cattle, we're gonna, we're gonna have a problem. Um, other things are on us, right? Um, do we have enough labor? Do we have the proper nutrition program when they get here? Weather patterns, you know, if we have rain, it's, it's gonna be in mud and snow. This year, we had 10 days of rain at 37 degrees, mud in our pens, then we got a blizzard over the weekend and eight inches of snow, and then the week after that, we got two and a half inches of rain on the backs of these cattle, and it, it, was, it was just too much for them. But my, the last thing that we think about is the brand of the vaccine or which class of antibiotic. Pick one, use it, have a veterinarian work with you, and uh, that's, that's, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I'll open it up for questions and discussion as we, we have them, Jacob. All right, what questions do you have for Dr. Thompson? You can type them into the chat box there, or if you want to turn your microphone on, I have those muted now, but all you have to do is click on it. Do, do you have any? Um, do you have any particular antibiotics that you shy away from? Uh, well, I, the only one I shy away from is, is Mycotil, and it's not because it's not effective. It's just that it's dangerous, right? If I inject myself, um, so I I don't really mess with that one much, but. Uh, all the antibiotics we have today are extremely good and, and uh, you know, are efficacious. Hey. Other questions? Hey, hey, Jake. Yes. Can y'all hear me, Starney? We can hear you. All right. Talking about deep bedding on the, on the trucks. What exactly is deep bedding? Deep bedding is, uh, you know, like some straw, just putting some straw on the, on the truck so that those cattle can have a, a comfortable place to, to, to lay down. Um, uh, that's, what, that's what we're doing. I, I would love to get it today, and, and they say it's because they can't uh, clean the trucks properly, but I'd love to get some rubber flooring in there and some things that, that would provide more comfort for cattle, but right now, we're we're making up for that with some some deep bed on those calves when we transport them. Uh, straw is what we're using, or or maybe some corn stalks. How much of it, Dan? Are you looking at, you know, three inches versus eighteen inches versus six inches? Do you yeah. have any? three to six inches? Just some, just enough to cover that bottom of the truck to get some of the slop. You you'd be amazed at how much slop is on a truck <laughs> when those cattle get here. Um, the urine and the feces and, and uh, you know, so just some things like that that help help the cattle with their comfort. Got one more. Okay. But on the high, on the low risk cattle, you, you said you weren't giving them pasteurella. Are you assuming they've had it or you just feel like you don't need it? Uh, Feeling like they don't need it at that time. Um, we, uh, we, I would say that that uh, most of them haven't got it, but uh, if they have, that's great. But at that point in time, when they come in at 700 pounds or 800 pounds, um, you know, my my likelihood of those cattle getting stressed and getting sick is pretty low. So we. Uh, we don't we don't give it because we don't feel like we need it. Most of these vaccinations, we are cattle calf men. When we wean them, is it best to do this vaccination at that time? Yes. That I mean, we vaccinate at branding. Uh, obviously, you know, before turnout, about three months of age, we'll give them a, a modified live uh, five-way viral. We'll give them a black leg um you know and 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 kick them out and then when they come in for weaning 
obviously then we're going to revaccinate them with the modified live. We're going to give them the Manheimia Pasteurella vaccine at that time. Uh, um, you may or may not give another clostridial, but uh, if they've had one at branding, you don't have to redo that again at weaning. Um, the one at branding will cover those calves. But if you band them, you know, we, we want to castrate them at banding too, if you're not going to do it when they're babies. Um, or castrate them at branding, not banding, sorry, if a little slip. But uh, if they come in at weaning and you decide to band them then, you need to make sure you give them that black leg with tetanus. Yeah. Yes, I, I want to make sure I'm hearing the question correctly that a couple of people have some handful of calves and they're going to precondition them and then co-mingle them to sell them? Yeah, they're going to build a load with them and their neighbor. That's perfect. That's what, that's what we want to do. We want to, we want to precondition them and then we'll co-mingle them with your neighbors and, uh, um, and then, and then bring those cattle on and, and get a one load lot. That's, that's, that's my best recommendation for, for, uh, success on price of those calves. Um, y'all know more about it than me. Y'all should be telling me how you get better prices. <laughs> I had a feeling they weren't going to agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody kind of holds their cards close to the chest. <laughs> it wasn't my first rodeo either. I had, uh, had a first, uh, bought a few calves. Uh, <laughs> we, when I was at Cactus Feeders, we had to buy 25,000 head of cattle a week. Um, so to keep our line, we would buy and sell 25,000 a week and on average. And of course, you know, it's kind of like rainfall in West Texas. It'd come in two days. So we'd uh, get covered up pretty quick. Um, so we just buy what's available. Mm -hmm. well, one other quick question. Do you prefer knife cut or banded calves? I, if I own them, I prefer to knife cut them myself. And the reason is some of the studies we've done have shown, you know, it, as the calves get, let me back up. The lighter the weight the calves are, the less I care which technique I use. As the calves get bigger, most people will tend to gravitate towards banding because they don't want to have one bleed to death. I tend to gravitate more towards knife cut the bigger they get because anybody that's seen a bull that didn't pass his breeding soundness exam come into a feed yard and get banded at 18 months of age will understand that watching that bull go through two, it takes 21 to 28 days for those testicles to, to necrose off the body. Okay. And, and the pain occurs with banding at two weeks. But, and I've seen just as many cattle die from bad banding as I have from bad knife cut. The difference is when it happens. Knife cut, you knife cut them, you go out there, you see them, there's two pencil streams of blood coming out of the scrotum, their gums go pale, shallow breathing, they die, and you say, well, hey, he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Knife cutting. But, but uh, I will promise you, you get out there 30, 40 days on feed, and we have a calf die from tetanus, or we have not a good enough band where, where the blood supply and we get these big and large scrotums, or, or we just get calves that, that um, get an infection and they get a peritonitis from banding. And, uh, you know, we, we misdiagnose it from being from the castration because it's so late in the, you know, 30 to 40 days after we did it. So I, I, I prefer to knife cut to control hemorrhage on those big bulls, and I mean big bulls is anything 700 pounds or bigger, I'll use the Henderson stone tool that's the on the power drill that will twist those testicles off the bull and wrap that, that cord on itself about 20 times and prevent the bleeding. Little calves coming in, I'll use knife cut, open up the scrotum and just pull the testicles off. Uh, 
Thank you. You bet. What other questions do you have? Are you the one that has the show on RFD TV? <laughs> I am. Okay, I've seen your show several times, and I really like it. So just. Uh, I appreciate it. Yes, sir. I uh been very fortunate and very blessed. Uh, that thing, that show started, they filmed me out here in the parking lot uh, about 10 years ago. And, uh, they couldn't find anybody else to come interview, I guess. And then they said, hey, can we do you do a show once a week? And, uh, and we've had a lot of fun with it. And uh, I need to come down there and, and film some Doc Talks in Georgia. And uh, with Jake there and Dr. Fluerty and and uh, Lisa Nolan, who's the new dean of your vet school, she's uh, real good friends of my family. Um, I need to come down there and spend a little time in Georgia. I, I wish I was down there right now because it's starting to get – it's not terrible cold here, but this is the time of year to do it. <laughs> we can probably arrange that, Dan. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Other questions? Let's see, I've got one here in the chat box, Dan. It says, do you prefer knife cut cattle? Uh, it's hard to knife cut when it's been this wet. We, I don't know what you're like out there, but we have had crazy amounts of rain this fall. Yeah. Kind of the same question, but in, there's an environmental thing. Hey, hey, look, if the, I don't care. I mean, I, pick a technique you want to use and do it. I can tell you this, that, that – I want. I would like to have the testicles off of them when they get to me. And, <laughs> and uh, how you do it, that's that's up to you. But um, uh, you know, banding them, it will work just fine. It's a good technique, and it works fine. And if you're comfortable doing that, and you know, that's what that's what cracks me up is people want to uh, pigeonhole or have a one size fits all. When I walk out to a farm. I'm looking at the size of the calves. I'm looking at the facilities, our ability to restrain them, uh, how much mud there is, the time of the year, flies, um, you know, the expertise of the people I'm working with. All these different things wind up going into the Rolodex to make that decision. So I changed my mind on, on different groups of calves just based on all those different factors. So do what, do what you're used to. Do what works for you and, and don't, don't – don't listen to me. <laughs> All right. If there's nothing else, I am going to stop the recording. I will ask you if you're.